So we have a Gaggle team that is in the enterprise world, so they, they run a highly targeted um, account-based marketing, account-based sales dev um, role where we're going after enterprise clients, General Electric, Siemens of the world, um, understanding the entire buying consensus, all these we do there. Uh, we have a mass market team um, that actually works kind of the traditional SDR, out of cold call, email um, route, uh, and then we have an inbound person that takes all the inbounds and helps with like marketing assistance and that side. So um, do all sorts of things. Traditional world plus this new ABM, ABSD thing that's out there. So, so we have an SDR team of currently eight, um, most of whom are solely focused on outbound prospecting are either tied to two account executives or a senior account executive solely focused on them. Uh, our clientele is private equity. Um, family offices, anyone investing in private companies. Um, so majority of the day is hitting them with emails, cold calls, LinkedIn sales navigator, different types of tools to get them in the door. Uh, qualify and flip is the role. And so 
jumping in right into the whole topic of onboarding, what what does it mean to you from onboarding? Like, what are you trying to get out of that program right off the bat? And I'll just open up to anyone who wants to dive, dive into that, but what are you trying to get out of onboarding? So I think onboarding <laughs> here um, has to do with getting them up to speed, at least with some of the quantitative metrics and some of the internal processes that we have in place. Understanding that ramp is gonna be somewhat of a long-term uh, process and at least getting them comfortable with the day-to-day -day of how we need them to execute, uh, both metrics-wise and getting at least somewhat familiar with how their account executive handles the sales process here. So um, oftentimes it is just really getting them to get used to internal tools, whether that's how to navigate our CRM, uh, understanding at a high level what our clients want to see uh, when it comes to a prospecting email, and at least getting them in some sort of group that they can do it on their own, at the same time understand that they need to lean on other people as well. Yeah. I think one thing that's really important for us, I mean that, that all is stuff that we do as well and is critical. Um, one lesson I've learned probably the hard way in onboarding SDRs is that the most important part of their ramp for us is the cultural part. Um, for, for most of us in this room who have either been doing a job for a while or who are in leadership, like it's very easy to you know, know how much you value your team. It's very easy to know like how SDRs are treated within your organization. But I think for us, what we try and highlight early is like the stories of SDRs who have been promoted, who people can go to as resources for help. Um, remember, we're hiring a lot of people who are like fresh out of school, don't have like experience working in a fast-paced, hyper-growth startup before. Um, and whenever we, we hire SDRs, like we're, we're hiring them right now, um, we tell them that like, look, you'll have a person to go to for everything, and that person will be like a designated point of contact to help you with anything, whether it's fitting in with your team, whether it's understanding how to use the CRM, whether it's like booking your first demo, um, but we've got you covered and we have that support around you. Yeah, I think it's really important early on to understand how people learn, because other people learn differently. I, I just want to lecture and, and give you what you know, and you're going to just pick it up and fly, um, and drop you in the ocean and help you swim. And I think there's other people, what I've learned over time when we manager of the SDR team is, some people want to read a book, um, and you have to give them options. Um, so that's one thing I've, I've learned throughout time, and, and it's very similar to both of the answers to things I want to go out there and do. Um, also, that's organizing your time. Time management in the SDR role is the absolute most critical thing you can possibly imagine because it's so easy to get lost in the day and go sit in an email for 15 hours because I don't want to make a phone call and whatever else you're doing, and I want to go do research. Um, it's fine. I, I think it's, you just got to understand where uh, where they're investing their time in and teach them why it's valuable to get things in the right order, right? Yeah, I thought we were going to do a whole session on uh, doing research. But, uh, <laughs> Oh, whoa, whoa. punch it. The, uh, but it actually gets to a, a real critical point. You know, time, time management. I think that's the biggest challenge. And you're trying to compress a lot of information in a short amount of time, right? Yeah. So it'd be really interesting just to hear your experiences when you were that that early rep yeah. getting onboarded. Like, what worked for you? What didn't work? Yeah. Did you kind of hack the system to try and get yourself up to speed faster? So, so I got actually sat in the interview with my CEO, uh, and I asked him who the best salespeople were. Before. Was this that often? Was that often from Tinderbox? It's like, so who's the two best? Because I was already selling it at the job before I was at. It's like, who's the best? He's like, he's like, it's this guy and this guy. This is why he's the best, and this is why he's the best. Good to know. So I literally took those two people and sat in a room and I had a chance to SDR. So me as an SDR, I was really proficient in being a self learner, and that's what I hired for now. Is I found. When I wanted to learn sales and how to talk and how to write an email and how to have a conversation, I sat on a demo with the guy that was a salesman. That was the real typical sales guy. When I wanted to know the technical knowledge and how to do that, I went to the guy that ended up becoming our sole gun, right? So it was the guy that could tell me why certain things work together. Um, so I sat with him and he got a lot of institutional knowledge really quick just from just consuming him and his knowledge. Like, um, you, like you, just to be clear, you sought out. I sought out, first. Absolutely. yeah, and I think that's something where if you're an SDR and you're not learning every single day, like if you don't learn one thing every single day, you're gonna fail. Like there's just so much going on. It's so, especially if you go into this account-based world and really just target it and understand, you have to understand your buyer so much better and you have to have so much more business acumen that you need to invest in their world as well as your world to learn how to do your craft a little better. So there's a lot of things you have to learn. If you don't have something to learn every day, you're probably not doing your job at all. Yeah. 
and I mean, business acumen, it's, it's such a huge thing, but I mean, obviously, if you're starting out, it really starting out your career, you don't have a lot of business acumen. I mean, Matt, I mean, how did you kind of overcome that? Yeah, well, I think I made a couple mistakes along the way. Um, one would be earlier on, uh, I agree that leaning on more senior sales professionals is definitely the way to go. Uh, a problem that I found was trying to replicate or duplicate their process. And as someone with uh, limited sales experience and someone who just doesn't necessarily know even how to start a process, I found myself getting into the weeds in certain instances rather than looking holistically at how are they managing their time? What does their calendar look like? Are there five, 10 minute block before a call? Um, how are they prepping for calls? Um, and, and a big part of what we try to do here is to have people shadow um, during that first month. By no means do we want you on the phones the first month for a couple reasons. One, we don't believe that you're ready. Um, and a big part of that is not only shadowing the day-to-day, -day, but really taking notes and being diligent about the process itself. I think in that first month, a lot of stuff, you, you're learning a ton, and it's great to learn a ton. Um, that being said, sometimes you learn too much. And how do you process what's really important compared to what are just some nuances to somebody's sales process. So, um, you know, how I evaluate when we ramp somebody up is really making sure that they're not going too far and really just looking at it from a general perspective, soaking in what's important and not necessarily trying to do too much too quickly. Right, what, do you, oh, what about for yourself? Just try to get, get up to speed really quickly. I mean, <laughs> what were you able to do? Like, what were some of your hacks? So I think the, the thing that I try and do now and that someone sat me down early when I, when I first became a sales rep and told me is, and I, I have my managers do the same thing now at Yacpo, is like explaining to SGRs the mechanics of their role, right? Because if you think about it, who are SGRs most influenced by? It? It's probably the account executives that they're passing deals to. And as someone who's been one of those account executives who's taken SGR demos, I know that like I only want to accept the good ones, right? And my feedback to SGRs is like, Oh, if this isn't a layup, like don't pass it to me, give it to someone else, right? <laughs> so I think it's our job as leadership to really like embolden SGRs to fight for their deals. Like in the same way that an AE will go to their sales manager and be like, hey, I need a discount on this. It's gonna be a great like company, it's gonna be a great logo for us, it's a deal that we need to win. I think an SGR should be able to go to their manager and feel confident in the same way and say like, look, this is a demo that I wanna fight for. It may be unqualified for our SLA, it may not fit the usual ideal customer profile for us, but I'm a subject matter in demand but, generation, and this is my thing. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, how do you get someone to the point to feel comfortable challenging? I mean, I know obviously like you know, leadership encouraging and all that, but you, know, you got to have at least a little bit of the, the knowledge or something to be able to say, oh, no, I'm looking at this. I feel like they confident. Like, how, how do you get to that level? You paint the picture for them. Like, I, we have, uh, we sell to e-commerce, right? Um, and so we had a deal closed recently that was one of our biggest deals that was sold to a Kickstarter that had not even been fully funded yet, right? And I remember when the SDR was pitching this, even I was like, uh, yeah, like, maybe when, maybe when it's fully funded, we'll make it work. But no, I mean, like, you believe in your product, right? You teach SDRs that, like, you're the subject matter on this. Not me. I'm a director. My priorities are elsewhere. Not even your manager, right? Who's focused on a bunch of different things. This is your area of expertise, and you have to fight for what you believe in and be have ownership over your job, just like a graphic designer would who's designing a poster, right? Like, stand by what you know how to do, because this is what we're paying you to do, and this is what you do best. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, because I think the... I love where you're going. I, I think you're going the right direction. And I would say to add on that would be, if you're a manager, get on the phone and go make a fool of yourself. It gets best when you get on the phone and you completely take it. Because then you show like, it's okay, Like I'm gonna mess stuff up. And I'm gonna call this prospect and I'm gonna say something that's so stupid or not explain our product at all. And it's okay when you fail. Because even if they get in front of an AE and you show a little bit of humility and you show that I can check my ego, like they're okay with sipping up in front of people. And, Maybe they, they mess it up. Um, you have to give them the, the atmosphere and the environment to be able to do that. Yeah. So I guess breeding a, a level of encouragement. I mean, what else? I mean, we're talking about from the individual perspective. Maybe it's good to maybe touch on some of the management perspective as well. I mean, how how prescribed is your SDR onboarding program? I mean, how how detailed do you get? I mean, if you you know, feel comfortable sharing. Yeah, please do, because like, I think a lot of people are kind of interested. Like, what does a, a real onboarding program look like? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I'll start. So we have a, a month long, what we would define as a, a structured onboarding, where you at first are gonna meet with 
all different parts of the organization itself. So we want you to sit down with the engineers. We want you to sit down with our consultancy team. Oh, and by the way, are you hiring? Do you do you like class type of hiring? So you hire a bunch of people, or are you kind of? No, we we hire individually. Okay. Um, that's how we do things. And we like everyone to at least have an understanding of, of the different parts of the organization just to get perspective. Um, and from there, that's when we will dive in maybe in the second week where we dive into the day-to-day -day of the SDR overall. So we find a playbook um, which goes over some of the um, internal processes, trying to give the SDRs a better understanding of who our ideal client actually is. And then from there, when we feel that they at least have a conceptual level of who we should be selling to, that's when we uh, think it's best for them to go outside and ask account executives and other sales professionals for help. Something that uh, hindered me at first was I was told to ask for help, ask for help, ask for help from day one. And what I realized is when you are going through some sort of rigorous uh, training process, um, you are not grasping those things. And you're learning how certain people approach the sales process itself. Um, so we really try to give folks a, a fundamental understanding of how we sell to folks and who we sell to. And therefore, after that, they're able to go out and branch it on their own. And, and we really um, we have a culture here where all of our senior sales professionals and account executives really go out of their way to help the younger folks here. Um, that being said, we like to hold off on that until we feel comfortable that they have some baseline understanding of what we're doing, or else those conversations are irrelevant. At least they were for me when I came, and I did not get much value out of that until I holistically understood what the organization was trying to accomplish as a whole. Yeah, so I like the idea of a kind of rotational system, so people get a flavor of like what exactly is going on, and it's really critical. Otherwise, it's like. You feel like you're in like this tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. So the, really, the first two weeks at GHI, uh, three things, um, and I keep it pretty simple, which is use cases so they can tell a story. Um, a lot of times, what happens is yeah, stories I'm six months into my job, and it's like, well, who's my other clients? Like, what do they do? How does it work? Um, so I bring in AEs, I bring in AMs, I bring in whoever it is to tell that story over and over. Uh, potentially clients. It's crazy. You're a BDR. You've never talked to a customer. Go talk to a customer. Seriously, go ask them questions. Go ask them everything you possibly can imagine. You have probably a few in your roster that are willing to tell you their story of why they bought your software. Understand the buyer. Understand why they do things they do, and just talk to them. Um, so that's something I do really early on is just, just make sure they understand the use case and why things work. Uh, after that, I teach them how to open a conversation, purely. Like, that is it. How do you get on the phone and get someone to say, all right, I hear you, and you made me think, let's chat. And that's it. Like, just to get the conversation to start, and then after that, how to write a professional email. It's crazy. People go to state schools and private schools and whatever else, and they still can't write an email. Amazing. <laughs> Super simple, easy text. Uh, and the way I teach them is communicate to the prospects the same way you communicate to anybody else in your life. You can easily tell a BDR to go look in their email inbox or your email inbox and go figure out the ones they're going to respond back to. And I bet nine times out of ten, it's an internal email, and the subject line is actually the question that you're asking. Hey, come meet me on seven. Great, and then the inside it's like, I want to chat about X, Phil. Like, that's the emails you respond back to on a daily basis. So go find the emails you respond back to and go communicate that way. Uh, way too often we get stuck in this, I'm going to build this perfectly worded email and I'm going to craft it for the next 25 minutes and this guy's going to respond back to me tonight. And then three weeks later they still send the same email and it doesn't work. It's crazy. And, and, and I, I played this game with, with marketers before. That's why I'm in, the, I'm in the marketing world now so I can say it. Uh, <laughs> Where they they were a perfectly great subject line, the email is perfectly worded, and my subject line was time to connect question mark, and my response rate was like three x minutes was. Is that game like it, it's because that's what you respond back to, like that's how you communicate. So those are three things I teach: how to write an email, how to open a conversation, and how to talk about a customer. I think I opened up your time to connect the email. It was you. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's been stolen, so it's don't use that one anymore. Yeah, that's, it's been, I, I got to I think of that half life on uh, on subject lines that yeah. email templates is like literally like half a day now. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's been taken. I've actually got it. It's funny. I get it now. Touche. Uh, I have a story to tell you later about a, a funny one I got from Max. But, uh, <laughs> Alec, yeah. share what do you have to what, What's the uh, I think, onboarding process? Yeah, so I think like a bit like both these gentlemen, we do have a structured onboarding that focuses on like product, sales, uh, SGR specific tools and processes. Um, we also like try and focus on crafting a good email because you're right, it's a it's a lot skill in some in some ways. But like. I think the most important thing that I've learned over my management career is to create an environment for people where it's like a safe space that they can fail fast. 
And I know that's easier said than done. In this room, we probably are like, yeah, I agree with that. But I know I've been in that place as a leader where I've hired SDRs and I need production right away. Right? And I'm sure like the agencies in the room can 100% vouch for that, that people need yes SDRs yesterday and can't even wait a week for them to like delay their start date, right? And it's because we need that production, right? We need the numbers, we need the calls, we need the demos, the deals. Um, and so I think making sure that you're creating an environment where people can fail. They can put their phone on mute for 90 seconds and ask someone a question. The person will have hung up by then, but still, they should feel like okay doing that. Um, and I think like for, for SDRs, the more emboldened they feel, and the more they feel like this is all okay, it's all normal, I can get hung up on, right? Not every call and person I connect with is gonna agree to a demo or is gonna turn into a deal, the better they get at the mechanics of their job because it becomes commonplace for them. Um, and I think the more you can create an atmosphere where getting hung up on is just something you laugh about with the person next to you as opposed to this devastating thing that happens to you your first week on the job, the more production and success you'll get out of your SDRs. So I think the brings some interesting points. My favorite sales quote of all time actually comes from Magic Johnson. It's uh, weird, but it comes from that. Right? Uh, his, his, his quote is... Way better my quotes than ours all, so... <laughs> I'll, I'll, keep it, I'll keep it. I'm a little proud. No, no, no. It's uh, way better. That's so it. the quote is, the professionals practice in private. Right? So if you give them an environment where they can practice in private and fail privately, where it's me and them in a room, it's just the two of us. It's them not it's sitting in the bullpen with everybody listening and messing up the phone call the first time. It's me in a room with them by themselves, and we're talking through when they mess it up. It's me in a buddy system, even though it's uncomfortable. It's them learning to be able to talk around people. I think that's it. Professionals practice in private, because when they go and it's game time, they show up on the court and they're ready to go. I think that's where you have to give them the ability to fail, but not do it publicly. So, uh, just to add to that, I think that's very important. I would say, at least in, in our culture here at who we sell to, um, I think that doing that private conversation is still going to be valuable. At the same time, you're still in that comfort zone. So um, oftentimes, what we'll do with the new SDRs is give them an account patch uh, that I would call not optimal um, and allow them to go out and, and figure it out somewhat on their own. That being said, it's very important at that stage to do call reviews, tape trainings and such where they're able to, you're able to evaluate their mistakes in the real world and then from there make corrections. So at least from my experience, yes, private is great. It really does help at the same time. There's nothing like really getting grilled on the phone and seeing how you respond. And then after that, reviewing it and trying to make the necessary corrections to ensure it's not going to happen again. I think that is that. You still have to, you have to find a way to build confidence. It's really hard as an SDR. Coming out of school and you're six months into the job, right? And you're fighting and you're, you're trying to do it. You get your ass beat every single day. That shit sucks. Like, good job. Like, it sucks. But you have to understand, like, I can give them a layout. I can go, like, hey, I got a favor to ask. Can you take a demo? Take a demo for me. I got a guy who just started. He hasn't had a demo in three months. He's been cranking it out. Works every day. Kills it every day. Just can't get any of the phone to say something. It's like, it's amazing that switch that pops when it's like, holy shit, I got something to answer. And they said yes. And all of a sudden, that mentality changes quickly where it's, I can do this. I can do this job. Um, it's, it's sometimes you got to give them a little bit of love. You, know, you might not have to know the, the, what's going on behind the curtain. Okay. That's actually a really good point. I mean, because People learn, people get up to speed at different, different rates, right? Uh, and I feel that, you know, we, for us, I think we're self-learners, you know, a lot of that motivation. We've been able to do well with that, but, you know, again, the reality is everyone gets up to speed at different rates. What do you do in that situation when someone may be struggling or may not be kind of hitting on all cylinders? I think something that's really important for us is like making sure that they develop that self-awareness to be able to identify those issues themselves. So I think the hardest thing, the hardest decision I've ever been as an employee is being put into a room and told I'm doing all these things wrong and not having any idea that I was doing those things, right? So more than like telling people like, hey, you're doing this wrong, here's how you can do it better, which is also helpful in some ways, I think it's about really like developing, especially in their onboarding, a fine-tuned sense of like, of what's good and what's bad in your organization. So they build that self-awareness themselves. Like point out the people who they should be emulating. Right? For us it goes without saying. Like if I was new now as a sales rep somewhere, I would look at the top performers and like and do exactly what they do. But that that isn't exactly intuitive for a brand new person who's just out of school. They might look at the person next to them who is intimidating to them for a different reason and be like, oh I want to be like you. So if you give them an idea of what true north is at your organization, you give them an idea of like what pathway to follow, 
they'll develop their own self-awareness and like, oh man, like our top sales rep is always doing this and I'm doing something completely different. Like that doesn't seem right. And that instinct will last you a long time for th their whole career. Yeah, I, I think it's a big way that. I think there's some people that like the idea of like an assigned mentor. So I have somebody I can go ask to, ask a question to. Um, I've had mixed results on it where I do it, but some people adopt it, some people love it, some people hate it. Um, it's like, hey, this, this, this is your guy, this is your girl. Well, it gets to your point where some people want to just read the book. But so, hey, sometimes I just want to go in the corner and I'm going to close the door, I'm going to read this book, and I'm going to come out and I know everything. Um, or some people want to watch a webinar and digest it and then come back and they can do it. Um, so I think you just got to figure out different ways and different avenues to get to them and, and, and reach them. When I think about this, I really think about two things. One is going to be um, inputs with regard to the things that you can control uh, when it comes to metrics. The other thing is going to be how you're sounding on the phones. Um, that being said, we don't necessarily evaluate an SDR's true performance, qualitatively speaking, in those early months, so it's very important for them uh, to be hungry, and as long as they're hitting those quantitative metrics and far exceeding that, uh, we can work on other things. That being said, uh, it is very important um, to understand where you do have flaws and proactively try to change them. Uh, the people that have not succeeded at our organization are folks that don't hit their quantitative metrics have not, and there have not been any improvements to improve uh, you know, on the phone. So um, you know, there's, there's a lot of examples, especially when you're hiring folks straight out of school. You can't necessarily expect them, and maybe this is just giving our audience here at Axial for them to be smooth talking and be able just to have really high quality conversations. So, um, it's very important for them to come in hungry every day and be doing everything that they can completely control. And then with regard to getting better on the phones, if they're correct to be asking for help, they're gonna be here and they're gonna stick around and we're gonna to wanna to help them succeed. It's the folks that uh, either give you, uh, you know, quite uh, you know, the mentorship and the tutoring that you're giving them, uh, aren't necessarily self-aware enough, and if they're not and you tell them, they still battle with you. Those are the folks that either aren't here anymore or decide to move on to other organizations. I think like what I, what the, to add on to that, I think something that like we often miss is the relationship you have with like you know if you're a manager with your department head or with your CFO or your CEO and understanding that like ramp times are different for different types of employees. Like I know for us at Yopo, something I very much support is like I think we have to take chances on people. We have to hire people from unconventional backgrounds, give opportunities to people who may not have college degrees, who may not have gone to certain types of schools, right? And the, the risk that we take on is that ramp time will be slower than hiring a bunch of people who took sales courses in college or who come from a similar background. And I think like working that out internally and ensuring that you have like a supportive ecosystem for those people to be able to develop is important as well. Because you can't take someone who's been an SDR at a different organization for a year and expect them to ramp at, or and expect that person to ramp or expect another person who has never been an SDR and maybe has never had the opportunity to do an internship before for whatever reasons, financial, monetary, socioeconomic, whatever it may be, you can't expect those people to ramp at the same times. So it's on us as leaders to take on that risk and take on the gap that exists for those people in terms of providing them the business acumen, making sure they feel supported and understood and making sure that they feel that they can learn at their own pace. Yeah. It's interesting, so I think where the way I think of it is you have to be so programmed. Like I've now hired hundreds of SDRs, trained hundreds of SDRs, so I've been through the lot of things. I know what's gonna happen. You're gonna hit this road bump and it's gonna happen. So you're gonna hit 3,000 phone calls and all of a sudden the phone doesn't matter. I get on the phone, I can do it all the time. But it's 3,000 phone calls. I've done the data. I know that there's a ramp time that happens for me to feel comfortable on the phone, it's 3,000 phone calls. You get there, you're good. And there's other things where level setting from day one where it, Day one, I'm talking, the first time I speak to you on the phone, when it's a phone review, is, hey, this job is going to take X months before we even talk about promoting you. I turned down jobs prior to becoming, I worked it out, I mean, when I just graduated college, because I didn't tell them why. So I think if you say that, hey, it's going to take 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, make sure you explain why it's going to take that long, it's just, there's a lot you need to learn, and these are the things I'm going to teach you in six months, nine months, 12 months, 13 months, 15 months, whatever it is, and this is where it's going to take you. So I think if, you have, if you're that programmed, there's this level of, wait, you said this is going to happen, and it happened. A lot of times I've had, I've had top performers. I have people that come out of the gate and crush it. Every single time I've seen a top performer, somewhere between 14 months and 18 months, they fail. And they fail hard. Like they go from like, I'm cranking out dozens of opportunities and demos a month to, I can't get anybody to pick up my phone call. Don't know where it happened, like, just disappear all mm -hmm. like, And it happens to everybody. So I think it's something just to give them that and program that in their head of, 
it's going to happen. You're going to fail. Trust me. Like I taught you the things. Like you're going to get through this. Um, I think that's where you have to be able to give them that guidance, and it takes it takes a lot of failing and, and understanding and training and teaching a lot of people to do it that. It feels as if onboarding is really not some X period of time, like three months. It's always it's ongoing. It's an ongoing yeah. thing. Uh, I want to open up to questions. If anyone has any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. I thought there was some like some some interesting uh, background noise when you said three thousand calls, but. Uh, yeah, I'll continue to ask questions, but if anyone wants to interject or has a question, please, please do ask. Uh, I want to hone in on this idea of the conversation. So I think you, you can teach mechanics. You can tell people, like, read these types of industry news sources. You get up to speed on, you know, high-end, you know, wealth management or business or e-commerce. But there's something that's, I think, very innate and and really critical about being able to have a, a really good sales conversation. What are some things that, other than just banging up 3,000 calls, but how do you get someone to be, yeah. to try and get to that comfort level of so, having a good sales conversation? So I think it starts, why I trained day one. Let me tell you about our story and why we, not our story, our customer story, why they're successful. Let story me tell you. Let me tell you why things are happening. But I think that a lot of times they can overcome objections, they, but the, you're in this state, which is where this customer was, and we got them to here. It's that success story that they can tell. Um, so that's day one training right away, and it, it's just ongoing forever. Um, that's one thing to get them to conversations, time, and actually doing it. Um, doing it in private, recording phone calls, talking to them, coaching through it, all that stuff has to happen. I'm just out of curiosity, how often are you, are you coaching SDRs? Like, I mean, like, is it like a number of hours a month? Or? Not as much as it used to. Uh, so now that it's spread so much more, but I think it's one of those things where um, I aim to get, my personal opinion is at least three hours of personal training a month. If you can't do that, you need to hire more managers. So if you can't get them three hours of your own time, probably the max for most people is uh, the Bezos rule, which if you can't buy two pizzas to beat the, the team is too big. <laughs> Um, it's, that, it's that kind of stuff. It's actually very similar to what uh, I remember uh, talking to Steve Richard of, yeah. and of Exact Vision, and he said something very similar. Like, again, you spend three good quality hours to get a work wrap, and you probably not giving them a good enough opportunity. Yeah. But, uh, Ollie, Matt, any thoughts on, on the sales conversation? How do you, yeah. how do you get them better uh, more comfortable? At least here, there's a big difference between pitching and conversing. <laughs> And I think oftentimes, as a, a young sales professional, uh, you have a tendency to know what you're going to say regardless of what the prospect is actually articulating to you. Um, so, and it's awful. So a big part of what we at least try to do here is to really get folks to listen to what the prospect's saying, right. and from there ask a question. I, and, and, and this is just uh, an example of our organization itself. Um, I think early on in our uh, SDR's life cycle here, they're solely focused on what is our investor's investment criteria. That's a conversation that's correlated directly to a sales pitch. More so, the conversation should be what are your business development initiatives and how can I potentially steer the conversation to solely focus on that. And that's where storytelling really comes into play where you can put real life examples. But if you're not listening and you're going off of some sort of script or, or too nervous to to ask something because it's not necessarily the way the conversation is going. That's where our cycles die, and that's where our SDRs early on lose a ton of confidence. So, um, getting them to mute the phone, make sure they're not wanting to continue to hop on and interject, and just truly listen to what the prospect's saying. From there, articulate either some question or, or some story. Um, it's just really something that we try to preach early on. He, he made an interesting point. So you talked about, hey, these are your business initiatives. I think it's funny because a lot of SDRs will also, often do the research and they'll know the answer to their question, or they'll talk to them on the phone and get the answers, and they'll get back on the phone with them and it's like, hey, uh, can you tell me your business process? But you already know the answer. Like, give yourself credit for the work you did as a VDR or SDR or ADR, whatever you call yourself. Like, like that's something you got to teach them earlier on. It's, like, it's okay to know something. It's okay to know that they talk to somebody. Hey, I called one of your account executives and he told me that this process sucks for you. Like, that's okay. I think like beyond that even, I think it's making sure that they understand that like they're the expert in this conversation, right? And that's hard to do with someone who is just out of school or has had a ton of 
work experience is not sold before. And the way you do it is by making them understand and identify their existing process with something they know well. So like I I tell every SGR who starts at Yacht on day one, like I'm like, think of a terrible movie that you like. And think of how many times you've told and tried to convince your friends to watch that movie. It's like, why do you care? You've seen it already. Why do you care if your friends watch it? But it's like you force them to. And then if they get on their phone during it, you're like, put your phone down, watch the movie, right? And it's because you feel passionate, you're like, you, you need to watch this. You're gonna love it. And it's like you need to make them feel that way about their this product. For them, it's like it's so it's such a new world that they're entering, so many firsts. It's like I also like to pull up photos of people who would be conventional prospects. So I, you know, have a number of friends who are e-commerce managers, directors of e-commerce. I'll pull up their LinkedIn's where it says like you know, responsible for overseeing all e-commerce strategy. And then I'll pull up their Facebook and show a photo of them at the bar. And be like, this is a real person. So when my friend Dave tells you that like they're all set, I believe me, he does not know what he's talking about because I was out with him last night and he's not all set. He's busy. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, <laughs> so like find people who are your prospects in real life and introduce those people to your team. Right, you're bound to have clients out there, you're bound to have customers who you can introduce your team to and make them real people, right? Because for a 22 year old, a director of whatever, or a VP of whatever can be super scary. But if you contextualize that person, they'll understand that like, oh, when that VP of whatever told me that they were too busy to take my call, they were full of crap. And I'm gonna tell them why. Yeah. Use jet skiing on the weekend. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's an important point. I do want to dig into this whole uh, concept of uh, quote unquote research. But if you do the homework, right, which it shouldn't take you like literally all day for one prospect, but yeah, just a very quick story. You know, someone reached out to me, totally cool. Uh, definitely did the research because they said, uh, "Yeah, I, I see you like some really extreme metal, and you know, it looks like a few like you know, his favorites, like Meshuga, Carcass, and like, oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's awesome." It immediately got my attention. Like, okay, it's perfect. At least digging, like, at least making an effort. I think that's. Critical thing, but I do want to talk about the things that we do to solve. Right? I think a lot of times in non work you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. You find ways of not using your time effectively, like research. I mean, what have you kind of seen on your front are kind of the non productive things during that grant time? I love the sales managers who just put it out there. Um, like uh, something that Jamie. One of the managers at Yahoo told me that she tells to her people is like, pick up the phone, right? And so I love like that idea because once you've gotten over it, and you're like, oh yeah, I need to just pick up the phone. Like that fear is lost, right? Yeah. But I've totally been in a place where I'm preparing, 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 and I've like gone full circle around the whole thing, and now I'm like rewriting information that I've already done. It's easy to do, especially when you don't know what you're talking about really, as a new SDR, as a new sales rep. So like, you have to have someone in your organization who is supportive and loving and friendly and all of that, but who tells them like, look, pick up the phone. Nothing is going to happen until you pick up the phone or until you write that email and click send. Wait for the whoosh sound, it's gone, the person's gonna respond or they're not. And guess what, you have to do a hundred more of those today. Um, and I think the sooner people realize like, oh man, not everything has to be perfect, but I have to do a lot of it. That's when they start to connect like, okay, let me like let this one slide. Yeah. I think that's something with you get focus. So you mentioned Steve Richard, his methodology, his three by three method. If you guys haven't seen it, I think you can Google it. That's really hard to find though. Uh, if not, email Actually, me. You know what? I'll do is I'll send in the, the kind of the thank you or yeah. just the, the recap of tonight. Three so things, three minutes. Yep. Find three things to talk about, three talking points over three minutes. So that's your challenge. And I'll play the game. I got it down to like thirty seconds now. So it's it's I can't get on the phone. I can't talk to him. Great. What's his name? What's her name? It's this, what's she do? She does this, great. Talk to her about this, this, and this. But, and I do, like, think we're super quick because I've done it so many times, it's repetitive, but understand it's not that easy at first. So it's talk this, this, and this. They go back and they write the email. Can you go and show you how to do that? So you slow them back down. I think it's teaching them to do that. Um, the three by three method is super strong. You definitely look it up from Steve Richard. Um, there's another thing we do, it's called the Ohio method. Right? The Ohio method is only handled at once. Yeah. If you do research or you do anything, put it in your CRM or your point of record or whatever it is, your Excel sheet, handwritten note, do not do it again. Like, don't go look up the fact that I went to Ball State University five times. Like, I like the Cardinals as much as the rest of us, but trust me, we're not very good at football. Like, it's good. <laughs> I think it's like, just do it one time. It's fine. You need three or five things to talk about. 
um, and then put me in a Google alert, and then you'll see when I put a, a new post or our company IPOs, whatever it looks right. I think there's things like that. Like you'll find that stuff out if you just set up Google alerts. I think something that we we like personalization is very key and hugely like successful, a big part of what makes many salespeople successful. I think for a lot of people in here, or, or any of us are, who are growing, like, you know, new go-to-market initiatives, who are trying out, like, new business units, you can't always get that much information, right? Yeah. Especially if you're reaching out to SMBs or smaller mid-market businesses. So it's like, if those are, if that's your team and you're reaching out to, like, smaller businesses where there isn't a ton of information available, there is no annual report to find online, right? Or you don't know quite who to reach out to, make sure your people are equipped with a great value proposition that they can then pivot. Make sure they understand all the different people they could talk to and all the different title levels they could talk to and equip them with that. Because ultimately, like, is it really that valuable to know that this particular decision maker has like eight endorsements for Microsoft Word on LinkedIn? Like, is that really gonna help your sales process? Or is it gonna be better for your sales rep to understand like, oh, this is exactly how I speak to someone at this size business who probably, maybe not always, but probably will have these types of problems. Like, let them make those assumptions and develop their acumen that way. Yeah, you can also write email, like an email chain by persona. So they have like, here's my marketing track, here's my IT track, here's my sales track, my HR track, whatever it is. Uh, and then you can use a method um, that Google uses, which is 1080-10 rule, which is 10% customized, 10, or 80% template, 10% customized. So I'd be, hey, I, I saw you like death metal. Awesome. Da -da -da -da. This is why you should love my company. DM type the chat. P.S. I'll spark this too. <laughs> right. Go Cardinals, right? And I'll just laugh about it. But it's, I think there's something like that where um, don't overcomplicate, especially early on. Like I said, most of the people can't write an email to save their life anyway, so you've got to give them something to work off of, some base. Right. Um, and I think sometimes it's even training them to do things. So things like, hey, come to this trade show, come to this webinar, come to this white house. Don't send But it's one of those things where it's, hey, this is what I'm, but if you reach out to me, you're like, hey, I heard you talk about this, and this is why it's relevant to you, I'll reach out to you. Um, so I think that's, teach them how to do that. Go teach them how to fish and do it personalized. Um, but also tell them not to do that for everybody. Do that for like your top 30 accounts. Um, I think that's what's important. I think uh, at least in, in, in the industry that we're in, social selling uh, can be extremely powerful. So uh, before someone alluded to you, not necessarily thinking LinkedIn could be a very powerful tool with connections. I personally believe it, it really is. If I'm able to speak to an MD, an XYZ private equity firm, and I know that they are good buddies with someone else who's a client of ours, who understands what we do. I know at the end of the conversation, if I do a good job articulating how our, our value proposition, why they should work with us, the first thing he's gonna do is go call Joe uh, Smith at XYZ firm and get buy-in from them. Um, I think uh, when it comes to research on the company as a whole, it's important to have a basic understanding of what they're looking to accomplish. At the same time, what I found is when certain SDRs or AEs don't pretend to know too much, they really don't know that much about that company. So a big thing that at least I try to preach is, I certainly know a little bit, but not a lot about you. So it'd be really helpful if you could help fill in the gaps here, here, and here. And then that also gives you some ammo when it comes to articulating your value proposition once you give them the chance to really tell you how they view their company and what they're looking to accomplish. Couch it as a question, yeah. not as declarative statements. Uh, oh, no, we do have some questions. Yeah. Please state um, your name. My name is Nick. Uh, From where? We're here in Axel. Uh, ah, excellent. Question, you mentioned coming to terms with the fact that your prospect is the expert on the subject. Uh, I'm just curious, how do you balance kind of stroking your prospect's ego versus finding an opportunity to be assertive? And if there is a difference between that distinction for an SDR and an economic Okay, just for folks uh, on live stream, so trying to find the right balance between assertiveness and ass kissing. <laughs> summarizing. So um, I, may have, I may have misspoke. I think like what I was trying to get across is that my sales rep is always the expert. At least in what we're talking about, right? Like individual prospects may be experts on their budget, their buying cycle, what they're currently using. But I try and convey to each of my reps, whether it's SDRs or account executives, like you are the expert on what we're selling and we've cornered the market on this. Um, and by giving them that confidence, even if it isn't fully true until they ramp up in their role, they feel more inclined to like actually give real pushback to things that people offer. I think we all too often accept in our business life objections that we don't accept in our personal life. 
right? Like, in, in real life, if, if we ask someone to do something, a friend to do something, they don't do it, we get angry, right? If in real life we ask someone to go out with us and they don't, like, we get upset. But somehow, we as salespeople are so inclined to take no for an answer and say, like, oh, I guess if you say it's not the right time for you and your budget isn't suited, like, you probably know that better than anyone. But it's like, remember, the chance you have with this person probably is lightning in a bottle. Chances of you getting them on the phone again is probably slim to none. Like, put it all out there and remember that you're the person who understands your product better than anyone else at that company. They don't know exactly what you do. They don't know what you've done for the tens, twenties, hundreds, thousands of customers you have, and they don't know what you can do for them until you're able to show them. So I think you can always fall back on stories. Again, like, I can't hit on that enough. Like, know your stories, like, how to go sell people, how we're successful for our customers, because it might not be a perfect use case, but understand like, how, how they might go to market and why somebody else might fit, uh, and how your product works with that. And I think just be able to talk to it. Um, I think be honest is just the easiest thing, just be honest. I've actually seen SDRs, and it's the funniest shit I've ever seen, but like, get shut down, hug up the phone, and I was like, call them back and tell them you're, you've been doing this for two months and see what happens. They were, like, call them back and say you've been doing it for two months and see what happens. Like, you just failed, like I heard it, everybody heard it, laugh it off, call them back. So you, it was a VP of sales. Call them back, it's like, hey, I just called you. You're like, yeah, I know. Like, Listen, I've been doing this for two months. What did I do wrong? And they're like, yeah, this is what you said wrong. Like, okay, and they're like, VP of sales, this probably works for VP of sales because they have a little bit, they've probably been there before. Yeah. But it was the, I wish my reps would do this. It was like, what's your name? What do you do? I, and they started asking questions. Like, it was just pure, brutal honesty of like, wow, I just really messed that up. Like, I can't believe I fucked that up so bad. Like, I, I don't know what to do. Like, here we go, let's work through this. And I think there's something you gotta, you just gotta be yourself. And just, I don't know, have to be you, just be honest. To answer your question about the ass kissing, I think like, uh, is that what we're calling it out? Yeah, the industry term. So, okay. right. Okay. Our wonderful prospect. So on that end, like, well, I think a little bit of it goes to show that you're a human being, right? So like, hey, I saw you on this panel. I saw you were, you know, uh, featured in this webinar. I saw that you wrote this article. Like, it just shows that like, oh, this isn't a robot, right? Because how often do we get emails and we're like, mm, that's a robot. And we know better than anyone in this room, right? So I think like going a step beyond that, really what people are gonna care about is how you influence their life. Like every manager wants to become a director, every director wants to become a VP, every VP wants to start their own firm, right? And that's pretty universal logic. So if you focus your value proposition around like how great their article was, like you may get a response back, but you're not actually setting the stage for a successful business conversation. If you talk about like, if you, talk, if, if you were to reach out to me and tell me what you could do for my team, who's like struggles I take to bed with me at night, and you were to tell me what you could do for them, that's when I would be like, yeah, I'll give you all the time in the yeah. world. I, I, I think it's really important, at least when I found it, and we can talk about this offline as well, but <laughs> to build some sort of peer level report before even diving into any value proposition or sales conversation. So taking that first one to two minutes, maybe bullshitting with them on the phone, just to get their guard down a little bit. Um, I found that people are much more receptive to uh, answering your questions and taking pushback from you when you do build that level of, I'm not going to call it trust, but at least that that general understanding that there's two human beings on both sides of the phone here. Um, and oftentimes, this is something I struggle with, is, is that first minute, two minutes. And when I hear other sales professionals really bringing down their guard level that they know they're in a sales conversation, but it is a human, they're able, they have so much more leverage when it comes to pushing back, when it comes to objection deception. And one thing that we really appreciate with it is feel felt found and really trying to put it in, in, understand where they're coming from, and then from there, Particularly that to some sort of story yeah, where maybe not everyone knows uh, field felt found. Maybe just briefly explain that. Yeah. So field felt found is a is a sales tactic to give the prospect one an understanding of that you understand where they're coming from, um, that the clients that you are now dealing with and you work with have felt the same way, and what they found from working with you. And this is where the story really comes into play. With that third is giving them true context on why their objection might not necessarily be an objection. Um, but then you can work your way around that and by using storytelling and by putting yourself in their shoes and giving some sort of tangible evidence to a client that you're working with that had the same sorts of feelings, it really at least makes them at least evaluate again where they're coming from and if they can potentially see things from your perspective. You brought up an issue point that we'll move on to this potentially, right? So I think it's one of those things where everybody that's a director wants to be a VP, everybody's a manager wants to be a director, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, there's an acronym that's out there, it's called WITHM. Everybody's ever heard. It's what's in it for me. 
And I think it's like if I can walk up to you and say, I'm going to sell you this offer that's going to make you VP, you're going to be like, all right, let's play. That's all right, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I think like, if you can't explain what's in it for me, I don't care. Why, why is it going to help me, my daily? Like, you're going to give me 10% more time back in my day. That really needs to be part of your call. Like, that, to me, that's the more important part of your call research is understanding when you get on that phone or you send that email, you know, clearly conveying why this message is really yeah. important. Uh, and I think sometimes we forget that as salespeople, we're not trying to, it's not about pushing a product, you're affecting change. We're all change agents in the room, and that's why we're trying to read scripts, be this robot, it always fails at every single time. Uh, because there is a human factor in everything I do. Is there any other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, I have a question. David Maurer, I used to work with Ali at Double Dutch. Uh, currently looking, by the way. Uh, I'm curious about sales productivity software. Other than your CRM, and specifically for your SDR teams, what software could you not live without, if you have one, that you think is amazing? Or what are you looking at that you think is the next um, this uh, is something I've learned since our time working together. Um, it's not, this isn't a software, but like I know I couldn't live without like a whiteboard. Like it, it's so, it's like it, it, I've had so many companies reach out to me like that sell leaderboard software and stuff like that and they all have their place in the market but like to me like what SDRs at Yahoo check more than anything is the whiteboard. And I've like caught people like changing their numbers when the demos haven't officially qualified yet. I'm like, ah, no, hold it. But like something so small that showcases to everyone like how well they're doing uh, can be really powerful and can motivate people more than like a hundred dollar gift card or like even like the opportunity to be involved in something cool. Like th that reputation and that self image that they're presenting to the world, whether it's on a whiteboard, whether it's a digital leaderboard, whatever you got, like to me, I couldn't live without it. Whiteboard, I think that that's cool about the whiteboard, just as an aside, that feels communal. Mm -hmm. You know, in a way that maybe like a, a digital leaderboard things don't necessarily feel as personal. Yeah. You don't need an app and own it. Right? Uh, so, the way I think software, so we're in the sales productivity software space, right? Um, the way I think it's different though. So, I look at it in the sense of, my thing would be a process. If you don't have a process, you can't buy software. Um, so, I think that's it. It's a really well documented process in the playbook. So, that would be our playbook that says, here's your job. Um, everything, in my opinion, always has to be black and white. You hit 100%, you did it. If you're 99.9, you missed. Um, you're at 75%, you didn't hit. Like, whatever it is, it's too black and white. Or it's, if you get to X goal, then you're going to get Y as the result. Um, so I think making it as programmed as possible. Um, I absolutely hate talk tracks, so I throw those out most times. So it's like, I'll give it to you, but as soon as you get on the phone, we're going to break the It's not going to be your blanket. You're going to make sure you do your job. Um, so I think there's having a really solid process. Um, once you have a good thought process, I would look at, I think the best thing, there's really not a tool I can say we could absolutely live without. I, I love sales loft, something to manage cadence um, of some sort, it's great. Um, I find Yesware, for example, yeah. um, not only for uh, being able to streamline some inefficiencies when it comes to trying to reach a broad audience with, with email. So we are able to identify which uh, emails across the team are the most uh, successful and they're changed some of our processes there. But it also gives us an understanding of which process, uh, which prospects are engaged, either before we've actually engaged them or once we have, are they reading our emails? How many times have they opened it? Are they sending it out to other people on the team? Are they opening PDFs? Are they clicking on certain things? It really gives you a, a good understanding of one, if a prospect's legitimate, and two, if they're truly evaluating potentially using your tools. Um, and oftentimes, if I am familiar with a prospect and I can tell they're not necessarily opening my emails or different links, I'm probably not gonna spend as much time on that prospect as somebody else who I know is truly engaged, regardless of how far along in the sales cycle uh, they might be. So that's at least one that you know I, I at this point, would have a huge problem. And anything to be able to track email opens is yeah. hugely valuable yeah. for reps. Yeah. I think no matter how oh, oh please go uh, ahead. I think no matter how small you are, you're never too small to have a great like talent acquisition tool. Um, this is like 
somewhat biased because I used to work at Greenhouse, but that's not why I say this. Um, it's an SDR is the hardest role to hire for, right? Like with an iOS engineer, you can look and see what they've developed before, right? With someone who's been a graphic designer, you can ask for their portfolio. With S even with someone who's an account executive, you can ask them to demo the product that they're currently selling, right? And see how their skills levels are from there. But with SDR, it's so hard to find the right person. And if you don't have a tool that's there to help you make like judgment-free decisions that are both like good for your company, fit a profile that you're looking to seek out, and like help you make decisions that are like good for whatever culture you're trying to develop, you'll make hiring mistakes. So even if you're going from two to four, or four to eight, like even if you're doing not that much hiring, having a tool to help you with that is crucial, because those four people are gonna change the way your company functions, right? Yeah. We had a question there in the back. Yeah, so name? Uh, Brendan. Um, so I actually used to work with Ali. This is actually a problem that we had had at one point at Greenhouse. Well, so you mentioned practice in private and professional. But so at what point do you pull a plug and put them in public where they're now okay with failing in front of their team and getting that support with the team and now getting that from a lot of the That's around. good point. And yeah. w when do you throw them into the proverbial fire? As soon as, as, soon as possible, right? Uh, so usually it's post that first two weeks. Um, we usually throw a few like old inbounds at them, that kind of stuff, just to get them on the phone. Um, but the practice and private thing is not a good thing. It's not a upfront and you do it for 30 days thing. It's a you're always going to do this as you work here. I am always going. To, I don't give a shit if you're the best performer in the room. Like we're going to sit down and I'm going to grill you, and I'm going to make you better. And I think that's something you have to continually push and push and push. Got to be continuous. Uh, at Cebo, even if you're a top producing rep and you close like a 50 million dollar deal, <coughs> you still have to sort of find that out. I got that was no exception. I went yes. all the way up to the executive level. Um, so always be doing it. Always find practice time. So any other questions? There was a few. Uh, okay. Yo. Hi, I'm Yoram. I've never worked at Bally, but thanks. I love it. I know. I, I love the energy. It's um, feel Bally cool as well. <laughs> I, you sort of touched on this a bit before, but I guess what are the things that you've seen, and I know everybody's different, but what are the things that you've seen that have made people, that people have done, that have made them the biggest successes, and what are the things you see again in the game which people keep doing and keeps causing them to mess up and fail? Like period. Um, I think one, probably the most difficult thing that I deal with and our team deals with is as an SDR, you can be doing everything in your power to succeed. At the same time, you're not necessarily uh, in control of the full sales process. And how you keep someone motivated when they are <coughs> creating, when they're hitting all the quantitative metrics, exceeding that, sounding great on the phones, and for whatever reason, the rep that they're supporting isn't bringing in money. Um, this is something I've gone through. This is something that some of my, my teammates as well have gone through. Um, and I think that really comes down to more a personality type itself. If you are not willing to continue to grind it out even when things are not working out and understand that they're outside of your control, it's really more so uh, people don't succeed when their attitudes are bad and they uh, continue just to, to dwell upon things that are outside of their control. Um, we, we understand that folks here don't have full control over the sales process. There are certain measures they can be held accountable to, but if they're hitting them and they're continuing to try to seek outside help, they're great employees for us here at Axios. So it really comes down to a motivation thing when I think at a SDR level, you are not necessarily in full control of, of your, uh, you know, the money that's coming to the door, and that could be something that really sucks. It's tough to deal with. Something I look for in the interview process and try and cultivate people early on is like, people who have the desire to do the best and not their best. It's a very ugly idea when we think about it because the whole thing that we're like taught from childhood is like do your best, right? As long as you're doing your best, like everything will be okay. And the truth is, in like a quantitative world like sales, that's not always true, right? Sometimes doing your best isn't good enough. And like getting that out in the open and helping people understand, like, look, you're giving me 100% of what you're capable of right now. That's not enough for you to be successful. So let's figure out what that delta is in between your best and the best, and let's figure out how to help you like slowly climb. Um, and I think getting that out in the open and helping people understand that like, oh man, even if I'm putting in my definition of what great is or 100% is right now, I'm still not there and giving them that additional place to grow can like turn something in people's minds that will take them from being like mediocre to top performers. Yeah. It's interesting. I would say the biggest thing is 
Most PDRs don't work very hard, like, to be honest. Like, they don't work hard, they don't work hard enough. Um, if you look at the ones that are super successful, they put the extra time in and they don't need to. Um, and that's hard to hire for, actually. It's really hard to hire for. Because everybody in the interview tells you how hard they work and how great they are. Um, not to be cynical, but it's true. And I think it's like you gotta, you gotta find the people that, from your point, I think your point's spot on, which is it's not that I wanna do my best, it's I wanna be the best, and, and, and I am gonna be the best. Um, and that's, that's where you gotta hire for that kind of stuff. And then self learners, people that continually do take it upon themselves. Uh, question I learned is what's the last book you read and what you learned? Uh, and I asked that in an interview. And typically, people that can give me an answer are usually pretty solid BDRs. Yeah. So. Or I usually ask, like, what do you do, like, you know, extracurricular activities? Yeah. Um, you started something from scratch. Yeah, you know, those are usually really good indicators. And a few other questions I want to be able to get to before we close it out this evening. Um, all right, the, the blue shirt. Thank you. Uh, a name? Daniel. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, we barely touched on uh, incentives in terms of uh, SDRs incentivized for a number of emails, opportunities open, bonuses on close deals. What have you seen is the best kind of balance between all those? So question on incentives, and you know, I think it's, it is a critical topic. We'll probably dig into that a little bit more in a, in a separate talk, because it is such a big topic. We just, you know, your quick thoughts. I have an acronym for this one. Um, it's SAPS, Stuff, Access, Power, Status. So it's like making sure that you understand that not everybody's driven by money, and making sure that some people like stuff, which is like a gift card or a bonus, a cash bonus. Some people like access, being in meetings or feeling involved in like committees or picking new things. Some people like power, the ability to like manage other people or decide on a process. And then some people like status, right? That's like the special desk for the top performer or the crown on their head. And I think like developing an incentive structure that appeals to all different types of people. Yeah, I don't know where mine is tonight. Mine's a wrestling belt. <laughs> Making sure you develop an incentive structure that appeals to all of those people and not just the money motivated ones that we think comprise most of sales, um, you'll be you'll be all set. Yeah, I don't know if I can answer that better. Um, I mean, it's good. I, and that's perfect to answer a good acronym. I'm an acronym guy. I like acronyms. Um, and I, the only other thing is, wherever you want, where you want your conversion to be, um, I would be yeah. on that. I'd be careful of being really too far down revenue and downstream in terms of paying off of like a closed deal. They can't affect a closed deal. They really can't, and you, you shouldn't expect them to. Um, maybe an additional spiff or incentive, but their OTA should not be directly reflected of something so far down revenue. Uh, and I'm happy to share my incentive plan if you want to email me and I can show you what I'm building on. I respectfully disagree there with that. I think that it's very important for an SDR to be somewhat tied to um, some sort of uh, commission when it comes to close revenue, given that I think one, it keeps them more engaged in the conversation itself. It makes them want to continue to learn how uh, account executives are handling certain uh, facets of a sale, and just keeps you it just keeps you more engaged. That being said, what I mentioned before, how do you keep people motivated when they don't necessarily have full control of the sales cycle? So here, at least, uh, half of your compensation with regard to OT is going to be uh, CR, close revenue, and the second is going to be certain quantitative metrics where you are influencing uh, at a certain point of a sales cycle. Um, we're not gonna compensate you for creating opportunities because sometimes people can create crappy opportunities. We need to see that it's qualified at a certain level and therefore also, if someone's not closing deals and that's outside their control, they're still being rewarded somewhat for their day in day out performance when it comes to at least getting the AE to where they need to be and not have control after that, so. Yeah, there's a lot of factors with that, like contract value, like the sales cycle, a lot of this stuff. Actually. And that's why this really, this will be like a separate topic in 2017, because uh, there's a lot of different opinions, and I have like a few yeah. on the subject as well. I'll take one last question, and uh, uh, in the back, in the uh, blue jacket. Sasanka, uh, Sasanka from OnSource, and uh, my question is, at what point do you measure rank? So, certainly, uh, love the philosophy of being supportive of the SDRs, SDR world has changed and it's evolving, right? So when you have a team of 30, for example, and you have different people coming in, at what point do you quantitatively look at, all right, what point do you rank to be either in or out? Because VCs, right, they don't really care about SDRs. They don't care. They want to know the numbers, so you have to be able to plug in and say, all right, here's the predict. If we hire these people with these profiles, they'll ramp up to S. And you should have that conversation with SDR. 
that kind of thing. You know, if you don't get to X, then you have to have a conversation. And it's a question, not a like right, statement. It's a uh... Well, VCs are people too. They, they do have feelings and they, they, they do feel emotions sometimes. Uh, but it's an important question. I mean, you know, what is that rant period? When do you have to just say, uh, "Sorry, it's not working out," or "Yeah, this is this yeah. is good." And how are you measuring? And in the yeah. measurement. So I think really it starts with hiring in the appropriate time frame. So you hire too late, and then you put yourself in a position where you have to ramp too fast, and then you mess it up, and then they get fired. Like this, is what happens? Um, so I think planning ahead of time and make sure you have the appropriate headcount when you need it. So if ramp is three months or six months, which is typical benchmark for industry, um, there if you go to Bridge Group, uh, they have a whole study and they've done hundreds and hundreds of surveys and they find a benchmark if you don't have it. And if you do have benchmarks internally, go back and look at your data and figure out where they start to perform consistently. Um, and then from there, that's like that's your baseline. It's hey, it's four months, it's five months, it's six months, and then you have to hire appropriate. Yeah, they could. Uh, recommend more highly enough uh, the bridge group. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. is uh, yeah. spectacular. What I would say is like uh, that. That I agree with all of that. I think like something that. Well, first, I this is something that I feel strong about. I like will not couch out to investors on like how SDR teams are doing because it's always a work in progress. So if you can do that, please try and make sure that like that you don't give into those demands. If you do once, then you have to forever. But Beyond that, I think um, something that's important to me is measuring people in cohorts or in classes. I think like the thing is like stuff always changes, right? And you can never measure someone's ability at a fast-growing startup, whatever scale you are, on a pure black and white thing, right? Because something as simple as like your trainer being out sick for one day can totally affect how quickly a certain class ramps. Maybe missing one set, one training module is going to affect how quickly they ramp. Maybe like the trainer rushing through one thing and slowing down on another is gonna affect the way they ramp. So like the best way that I've found to be able to gauge how people are doing is by measuring them in cohort. So like I have SDRs who are two weeks old, not uh, two weeks tenured. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, though, though I would like to breathe them. Uh, four weeks, uh, two months. I'm very scared <laughs> of your office now. <laughs> you can come visit the lab. But no, I think making sure that like people feel like they're part of a class, they're part of a community, they're part of a cohort, and just like many things in life, you're measured against the people next to you. And if everybody has managed to pick up something and one person hasn't, then we know what the problem is, we know how to address it, give them a fair period to address it. And I think most smart people who we try and hire will know it themselves, right? And they'll be able to like understand that maybe this just isn't the path for them. I think it's really twofold here. So at, at least here at ASU, we really evaluate, are you hitting uh, opportunities greater than certain quantitative metrics two months after you've gotten the phones? Now, I don't necessarily think that that's somebody who's fully ramped. Um, and I think this is really tough to evaluate when someone has ramped when it comes to phone ability and qualitative skills. And I think that's something that just kind of clicks at a certain point between months five and months eight, where you have really developed into the role. And I think that that happened. I, I think it's really, a, it, it clicks. I know for me, I was sitting next to my colleague Jack, who's here, and I got off the phone one day and I said, I think I get it now. And that's something that's very hard to measure. I know it's probably not a great answer, but at some point you really feel like you're having conversations instead of qualifying. And, just, and, and it's that moment where I really feel like someone, at least in our organization, has fully ramped, and now they can really focus on honing their true sales skills now that those quantitative metrics have been taken care of, and now they're having real full conversations rather than just qualifying certain individuals before setting them through a sales process. Yeah. I mean, what you hit is flow, yeah. which is like a real critical thing in, like, yeah. in your career development. If you hit flow, there's actually a really great book, I think it's actually is called Flow, uh, that speaks to that, just that you know, when you start to hit your stride professionally, you're able to just kind of do things. Not necessarily on automatic, you're still kind of thinking and engaged, but it just it feels very natural. Yeah. Uh, Lightning round, last question. Like your top like awesome resource or inspiration. It could be blog, movie, book, whatever. This is gonna be a hard one answer. Google Alerts. I love Google Alerts. Um, Highly inspiring as well. Oh inspiring, sorry, John Barrows. His uh, his sorry, I thought what I could live with that. John Barrows has some great um, sales um, training and different articles that he puts out weekly and a lot of them I think uh, relate to an SDR's life cycle when it comes to that qualifying versus having conversations is something that I've found to be very... You hear that, Mr. Barrows? You need to come to New York next year. Um, 
people. Right? People are my favorite resource. Uh, it's too, it's, Trish Bertuzzi is too, way too accessible to be able to get, like, like talking to her, Steve Richard, you know, I mean, Ralph Barcy, if you guys haven't listened to Ralph Barcy talk, he gives you chills every single time, it's amazing. Like, just a great SDR leader, director, manager, kills it. Uh, Ralph Barcy, check him out, like, just, there's so much people out there that are so accessible to get to. Um, I think the, uh, like, yeah, I rely on, like, a lot of thought leaders and, like, to fill my brain with ideas and stuff like that. I think, to the best of your ability, try and be inspired by, like, your people, too. Because ultimately, like, we've hired these SDRs to do a job that is insanely hard, right? And, like, impossible. We've asked them to disobey all rules of public kindness that they teach you in kindergarten. Take note answer, right, be nice to everyone, we ask them to disobey those, we ask them to farm like hundreds of accounts, make like more calls than is socially acceptable ever, right, in a single day. So when you see people who work for you doing a good job, like figure out what they're doing and like be inspired by that and know that your process is working because the more success stories you can point to internally and like thought leaders you can develop within your own organization, the more everyone else will flourish. Because like we all look up to Trish Bertuzzi in here, we all look up to John Barrows, we all, you know, I look up to someone like Chris Pham who wrote Economical Growth, that's a really good book for anybody who's an SDR leadership. But like those aren't the people who are gonna get your SDRs to work harder. The ones who are gonna get them to work harder are the people around them who are kicking butt every day. So highlight those people as inspirations as well. Good. Yeah, that's that's super awesome. Can you just give a round of applause? This is awesome. <laughs> Thank you.